Computer power has revolutionized statistical inference. In this module, we look at the two main concepts that are behind this revolution, the Monte Carlo method and the bootstrap. We will discuss the main principles behind these methods and then see how to apply them in various important contexts, such as in regression and for constructing confidence intervals. Remember that very simple formula for the confidence interval for a population mean. We simply take the sample mean plus minus z times standard error. The reason why we use z was because the sample mean approximately follows the normal curve. Now what happens if we are interested in a different estimator, let's call it theta hat, for some parameter theta of the population, and the normal approximation is not valid for this estimator. In that case, such a simple formula is not applicable anymore and we have to do something else. Likewise, the simple formula for the standard error of the mean, which was based on the square root law, may not work anymore. So then what's the standard error in that case? It turns out that in such situations, simulations can be used to estimate those quantities. In fact, it may turn out that simulations sometimes result in better estimates than what we would have gotten if we would be able to use the formula for the normal approximation. Let's look at a simple example to see what the famous Monte Carlo method does. What's the average height of all people living in the United States? Well, this is impossible to determine exactly because we would have to measure the heights of all people in the United States. But we've already seen that we can actually estimate that average quite well. All we do is simply take a sample of size 100 and then we use the average height of that sample as an estimate of the average height of all the people. Remember, we talk about a parameter like theta when we talk about the population. So in this case, theta would be the average height of the population. We estimate that parameter theta with a statistic, which we call theta hat. And that statistic is based on a sample. In this case, our statistic would be simply the average of the sample. We already know that the sample mean tends to be close to the population mean, even for moderate sample sizes such as 100. And that's because of the law of large numbers. This is a simple example of the Monte Carlo method. Sometimes it's simply called simulation. What that method does is it approximates a fixed quantity theta by the average of independent random variables that have expected value equal to theta. Then, by the law of large numbers, the approximation error can be made as small as you wish by using a large enough sample size. It turns out that the Monte Carlo method can also be used for more complicated quantities. One quantity which is important in statistics is the standard error of a statistic. Remember that the standard error tells you roughly how far off the statistic will be from its expected value. There's a formal definition of the standard error which is given there. It's simply the square root of the variance when we think about theta hat as a random variable. So how would the Monte Carlo method work to estimate the standard error in this case? In the first step, we would get many, let's say a thousand samples of 100 observations each. Remember, we take 100 observations each because the standard error of theta hat is the standard error when theta hat is based on 100 observations. Next, we compute theta hat for each of these 1,000 samples, and that gives us 1,000 copies of these estimates, which we call theta hat 1 up to theta hat 1,000. Finally, we simply compute the standard deviation of these 1,000 estimates. The formula you see there is simply the formula for the standard deviation. The average of these estimates is simply theta hat bar. Remember the bar notation denotes averages. Um, I didn't want to put two superscripts on there to make it not too confusing, so I wrote down the average of the theta hats. So now this is not an average of independent random variables because the average of the theta hats 
is part of each of these terms, and so that makes the whole thing dependent. But the Monte Carlo method still works. It turns out that this quantity is roughly equal to the standard error. So while this example looks a bit more complicated than the previous one, what's really going on here is that it's simply an application of the law of large numbers. But the caveat is that this method will only work if we can draw many samples of size 100. In other words, simulation works if I can sample as much as I wish. The bootstrap pushes this a bit further. It makes it possible to use Monte Carlo sampling even in situations where I cannot draw as many samples as I wish. Let's look at a simple situation where I have an estimate theta hat and I want to know what the standard error of theta hat is. To explain how the bootstrap works, let's first look at the so-called plug-in principle. In the example we had earlier, we were interested in the average height of all people in the US and we estimated that with the average height theta hat of 100 randomly selected people. This simple step already illustrates the plug-in principle. We can't compute the population mean because there are over 300 million people and we cannot possibly measure all of their heights. So what we do is we plug in a sample of size 100 in place of the population and we simply compute the mean of the sample instead of the mean of the whole population. So let's look at what we did here in terms of histograms. There was a population histogram, which is the histogram of the heights of all the people in the United States. The task was to compute the average of that histogram, and that's impossible to do. So what we did is we drew a sample of size 100, we looked at the histogram of the sample, and we used the average of the sample histogram in place of the average of the population histogram. The reason why this works is because the histogram of the sample tends to look very similar to the histogram of the population. That's really the key idea behind the bootstrap. And we will see how this idea can be used in all kinds of complicated situations. The bootstrap uses both this plug-in principle and Monte Carlo simulation to approximate quantities of interest, such as the standard error of a statistic. To explain how it works, Remember how we used Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the standard error of a statistic. If I can draw a sample x1 to xn, then I can compute my estimator theta hat based on that sample. If I can sample as many times as I wish, then I can repeat this process many times, let's say a thousand times, and I get a thousand copies of my estimator. We saw earlier when we discussed Monte Carlo that the standard deviation of these 1000 estimates is close to the standard error of my estimator, and that's simply because of the law of large numbers. But remember the caveat in Monte Carlo was that we only have one sample and we cannot sample as many times as we wish. The trick that the bootstrap uses is the plug-in principle. It simply simulates from the sample histogram instead of from the population histogram. In other words, the bootstrap pretends that the sample histogram is the population histogram and then simply uses Monte Carlo. So how does that work? Drawing a sample from the sample histogram means drawing with replacement from the n numbers x1 to xn. Let's call those numbers x1 star to xn star. That means x1 star is drawn at random from these n numbers x1 to xn, and likewise x2 star is drawn at random, and x3 star is drawn at random. Such a bootstrap sample x1 star to xn star has numbers that are among the sample x1 to xn. Some of the x's may come up several times, and others may not come up at all. Now what the bootstrap does is it draws capital B bootstrap samples and computes the estimator for each bootstrap sample. So we draw a bootstrap sample just as explained above, simply by drawing with replacement from the original data, 
we evaluate our estimator and we call this thing theta one hat star. Then we repeat the whole process capital B times, let's say a thousand times, and we come up with a thousand copies of these estimators. Then we use these 1000 copies to approximate the quantity of interest just as we did in the example of Monte Carlo simulation. For example, we would approximate the standard error of theta hat by the standard deviation of these 1000 estimates. So in other words, the bootstrap uses two approximations. In the first approximation, it replaces the population histogram by the sample histogram. In the second approximation, it does Monte Carlo in order to approximate a quantity by the law of large numbers. Drawing a bootstrap sample by sampling with replacement from the data is called non-parametric bootstrap. Sometimes we know more about the data. For example, we may know that the data follow a normal distribution, but we don't know the mean on the standard deviation. In that case, we may want to use that information. Of course, the obvious thing to do there is to simply estimate the unknown mean and standard deviation, and then simply sample from the normal distribution with that mean and standard deviation. That's called parametric bootstrap. This type of sampling works if the data are independent, that is, x1 to xn are really generated independently. But oftentimes there's dependence in the data, for example, the data are observed over time. There are also bootstrap methods for dealing with that, but that's a somewhat specialized thing which we don't discuss here. Remember the simple formula for an approximate confidence interval. We take theta hat and then we go a multiple z times the standard error in each direction. So if we have a 1 minus alpha, for example, if alpha is 5%, we get a 95% confidence interval. Then we would look z alpha half, so we would look at a normal curve, and alpha half is 2.5%. So we would look at z point. 0.25, and we would simply plug this into the formula and get an approximate 95% confidence interval. We just saw how to estimate the standard error in case there's no formula for it. But remember the confidence interval is really based on the assumption that the sampling distribution of theta hat is roughly normal. That's the reason why we use the multiplier z from the normal curve. What happens if theta hat is not approximately normal? Well, it turns out we can use the bootstrap in a more ambitious way. In fact, we can estimate the whole sampling distribution of theta hat, not just the standard error. The idea is that the sampling distribution of theta hat should be close to that of the bootstrap copies. In the sampling distribution of the bootstrap copies, I can get simply by generating many bootstrap copies and making a histogram of those. This histogram may be quite far from normal. For example, it might look skewed like this. But I can simply find a 95% confidence interval by looking up 95% in the middle and looking at the appropriate cutoff points at each end. This is called the bootstrap percentile interval. You simply look up the right percentiles on each end so you have 1 minus alpha in the middle. An alternative way to do that is not to bootstrap the distribution of theta hat, but to bootstrap the distribution of theta hat minus theta. Why would one do that? The hope is that this is less sensitive to the particular value of theta, and therefore it may produce a more accurate confidence interval. The resulting confidence interval is called bootstrap pivotal interval, and the formula is given there. Now let's look at bootstrapping in a more complicated situation. Let's look at the case where we have pairs of data, and we look at a regression model. Remember our regression model says, that the y observation is a linear function of the axis plus a measurement error e. We already saw how we can use least squares 
to estimate the unknown parameters a and b, and that gives us least squares estimates a hat and b hat. Now we would like to have some standard errors for these estimates. How would we use the bootstrap to do that? The key point here is that we don't resample the whole pairs of observations, but rather we resample the error terms. Now, of course, we don't know the error terms, but what we can do is we can use the residuals in place of the error terms. Remember, once we fit a regression line and we have observations of the line, then the residuals are simply the vertical distances to the line. And if the regression line is a good estimator, then the residuals should behave similarly to the unknown error terms. While the error terms E are unknown, we do know the residuals because we fit the regression line. So we can draw a bootstrap sample from those residuals and we get n bootstrap residuals E star 1 to E star n. In the next step, we pretend that the estimated regression line is the true line and we add on the bootstrapped residuals. That generates a new set of observations y star. So the x's stay the same, but the y stars are now different because they are generated from the x's and the estimated regression line with the bootstrap residual added on. This gives us a bootstrap sample x1, y1 star up to xn, yn star. And from that sample, we can estimate the parameters a hat and b hat in the usual way by least squares. And now we follow the usual bootstrap algorithm. We repeat this whole process a thousand times, and then we estimate the standard error of a hat by the standard deviation of these thousand estimates a hat star, and likewise for b hat.